Welcome to Swiftly Spoken, a fan-made Taylor Swift podcast in which we analyze her artistry, including her lyricism, music videos, and full album retrospectives. We are your hosts, Lisa and Cameron, and in this episode, we're celebrating the Fearless Taylor's version anniversary by doing a mini retrospective and giving all the information there is surrounding the From the Vault songs. When this episode is out, it will have been over a year since Fearless Taylor's version was released and we heard the first full six Vault track lineup. So to celebrate this anniversary, we're going to be looking back at the origin stories of each song and discussing why they were chosen to be part of the re-recorded full version of Fearless. We're going to be going through the songs as they appear on Fearless Taylor's version. As we know, Taylor added a total of six songs that were labelled as being from the vault to her first ever re-recorded project, which was Fearless. From these six songs that were included, only two had never been heard before. The other four had been previously leaked in some ways prior to last year. All the songs were originally written from 2005 onwards, making some of them originally eligible to appear on her debut album. This means that the lines between debut and fearless songs were somehow blurred. And back in the day when Taylor spoke about the song said, I've been very selfish about my songs. I had this dream of this project, referring to her debut album, coming out for so many years now that I just stockpiled. I'm so happy that I did because now we have a second album full of songs and a third album full of songs and I don't have to lift a finger. So it seems like Taylor planned for a long time for her debut album, so much so that she had this massive vault of songs, which a lot of them, as we know, uh, we have as unreleased songs, like demos of them and stuff like that. This quote is interesting because things eventually did change. Yeah, I think it's mad that Taylor kind of thought at that point that that one, these songs were good enough to be she had enough good songs again to be on a second and third album and that she kind of intended not really to for someone that is such writes so much about their life and is such a songwriter to think that she kind of thought oh i don't even ever really need to write a song again for at least the next two album cycles which is just mad like i think that's it just shows that she was so happy with these songs and it is interesting to see what would have then been included on you know what the what we have from that mirror um kind of track list we have a rough idea of some of the stuff that was intended to be included on fearless but then the stuff that then would have been included on the third album it's just crazy that um um taylor had won so many songs and two was so happy with those songs that she at hmm. one stage in her life thought that she didn't really need to ever really write a song again it's, it's yeah. just madness and it's crazy to think that the evolution of her music would have been so different and it's one of the re reasons that I think that Fearless eventually included many different songs and replaced these older ones and then speak now, obviously, completely new songs, except for Sparks Fly, Sparks which Fly, we yeah. have previously discussed. Everything else is completely different. And it makes sense because the music industry changes and as she was living her life, like you said, she is a songwriter who likes to write about what she's going through. So it's crazy to think that, you know, she had it all laid out in a way that she had so many songs stockpiled and that's very interesting to see what will become of those songs obviously a lot of them we do know of some of them of course we're going to discuss now in the fearless vault and others hopefully in the debut vault yes hopefully and um that's one thing that is so interesting is that she has such a stockpile as she mentioned in that quote is that trying to pick for debut is going to be quite hard i think yes because there's so many to pick from um, some of which are really, really good songs, some of which, in my opinion, are not so much so. <laughs> so it is really interesting. And then obviously in our previous episode, as we mentioned, we've also got things like Crazier um, kind of floating around. And then obviously there's then the question of what about like I Heart Question Mark and Beautiful Eyes, because those were officially released on mm -hmm. the Beautiful Eyes EP. So debut is quite, um, it's interesting what's going to end up on there because there's so many songs to pick from, but then also other songs that, should really be on there because they were properly released and it's very interesting the whole kind of the songs from the debut era it's mad that they kind of continued into fearless into speak now and did have such a kind of big life and that taylor did really intend for them to do so she was happy for things like sparks fly to be on speak now because she had previously felt like those songs deserve to be on the third album exactly but it also calls into question like how much these songs could be changed in our Sparks Fly episode, 
we did go into detail about how many lyrics were changed and what we're going to see today as well there's a lot of lyrics that didn't make the cut and it's interesting to see how taylor is going to judge you know what's the best what's the worst what things can be changed what things she wants to leave untouched but yeah there is a big catalog that she really intended to be much more yeah and, and then i suppose when you mentioned that as well it's quite interesting to maybe think about whether some of the vault songs on red those lyrics were changed or maybe whether she felt mm-hmm. like her songwriting was more mature and um stronger so didn't feel like changing them um and obviously with those um red songs other than obviously things like better man and babe we don't really know what the original lyrics were yeah um, there's no way to compare no so it's interesting whether those were changed or taylor felt like her songwriting was strong enough at that point that that didn't it didn't need to be improved in the fearless era of course taylor also released the platinum edition of fearless which was kind of like a vault on by itself because it it was a choice of new songs being put onto fearless from the songs that she had written around that period so again the pool of songs to choose from for the eventual fearless taylor's version vault became much smaller unlike for red where we never had any of these extra songs in the first place or any platinum edition or any deluxe edition or anything like that yes yeah, so it's interesting because taylor kind of said um upon phyllis's release why some of these songs weren't included on the original album because because of the standard format of a cd this the album would be too long or taylor felt like she had to have a mix of sad and happy songs so some of the songs were too sad and all had a too similar vibe to some of the other tracks on the album so that's why they were initially left out and now why they are included on the vault okay so now we're going to go through each of the from the vault songs so we're going to start with you all over me and end with bye bye baby So first up, we have You All Over Me, which was written with Scooter Caruso back in 2005. Inner Circle had heard the song previously and had made a description of the song on their website. The description that they gave of You All Over Me was that Taylor uses some interesting ways to describe how she continues to be affected long term by how badly she got burned, how many tears she has lost and how much time she has wasted. This song seems to have inspired the guitar work in Taylor's All Too Well and her lyrical concept for the song Clean. It is one of the most beautiful rare songs and ends with Taylor humming along to the music. So it's interesting to see how the Inner Circle described this song before anyone else had heard it because it really leads us to see how credible they are at descriptions. How do you feel about this description? I think they did a pretty good job. I think they did quite a good job. I'm not too sure whether associating it with the guitar work of all too well is a little bit of a stretch and then the yeah, lyrical concept for clean mm. don't think that they inspired either of those songs so other than that the rest yes yeah, they do describe the song quite well and it is interesting how um and you see this a lot with taylor's inner circle descriptions that they use their lyric they use the lyrics of the song and rework it a lot in their description so sometimes it's quite interesting with songs that we haven't ever heard at all that maybe within their description there's a kind of there is some of the lyrics sat there Um, But no, I think they do quite a good job um, of describing the song. Either way, the song was eventually heard by most of us as it leaked, a demo of the song leaked in 2017. Eventually, Taylor's version of the song was released as a promotional single on March the 25th, 2021, and it was produced by Aaron Dessner. So obviously, here's the first big difference we can hear between this demo version and the original song and Taylor's version of the song is the production. The production by Aaron is much more popified in a way the country strains and the echoes i and the the acoustic guitar can't be heard as much so how did you feel about the production change yeah i did prefer the production change um i was never when the song was initially leaked i was never a huge fan of this song when i found out that it was on the track list for fearless i wasn't really blown away I was just kind of like, oh gosh, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I'm not a big fan of that song. But I massively prefer Taylor's version. And I think Aaron Dessner really did a good job of kind of giving a bit more life to the song, because obviously the original was a kind of demo. So maybe that's why it never really mm. felt very full. 
but um i do prefer aaron's kind of production on it and it does kind of have a very folklore kind right. of vibe which is mm. again something that i'm sure we'll discuss a lot in this episode that yeah. a lot of the fearless vault songs they don't feel like fearless songs sometimes they do feel like the production on them has a kind of very folklore evermore vibe and i think maybe that is because of aaron and i don't mean that in a negative way i prefer the original version and for that i have mentioned this before there's a version on youtube that kind of mashes up the original sound of it the production with taylor's version's vocals when describing the song he remembers painstakingly going over uh, especially the lyrics and trying to come up with all the different symbolic imagery they were going to use so she says that these different symbolic imagery references to how it could feel after you have your heart broken just to feel like you've been ruined by the whole thing and i think that's one of the hardest things about heartbreak this feeling like it's damaged you and now you carry that damage with you which basically is the message that she conveys in a very symbolic and metaphorical way in you all over me yeah and i think as well that's probably one of the reasons why it was included on fearless was because the songwriting was really strong on you all over me and i think even now it really stands stand strong just because the metaphors and the lyrics of you all over me um are really vivid devastating as well yeah, like the, the change in your pocket one always stands out yeah it, it, it's crazy it is uh, no I, I i think that's probably why one of the reasons why it was chosen for fearless and felt like and maybe that's why taylor back in the debut era felt like you know she had enough songs for that were strong enough for a second and third album with songs like you all over me because um lyrically i think it really really stands the test of time and doesn't feel dated or doesn't feel immature or um kind of childish because obviously it was written when she was you know very young um it mm, really stands strong now even taylor must have agreed with this because if we compare the demo version with taylor's version there's very minor minor changes to do with the lyrics there's only like two instead of saying you wasted time she says my and wasted time and instead of i tried she says i cried at one point but other than that the lyrics are almost unchanged so she really must have agreed and and thought that this did stand the test of time and i do think it does and we should mention as well that moran morris is featured on um taylor's version of the track how do you feel about moran morris's feature and moran morris's added vocals i love it i think that those added vocals in the background although obviously it's not a massive massive feature um, they do elevate the song even more and her voice really, really combines with Taylor's in a, in a magical way. I think without her vocals in the background, it wouldn't have elevated the song to what it is. Yeah, no, I agree. And I really, really wish that Moran had been a proper feature, um, like Phoebe Bridges. I think that it would have added even more to the song. And obviously this is something that is debated about a lot in the Taylor Swift world is when is it a feature and when is it a backing track? Um, yeah. And I think, unfortunately, Moran Morris fits into the backing track more than a feature. But I'm glad that she was given feature status, but I really wish she had had more of a kind of feature because I think that uh, Moran's vocals would have really added even more to the track. So the next song is Mr. Perfectly Fine. So previously, we did not have any kind of public leaks um, of Mr. Perfectly Fine, even though the inner circle kind of had, had knowledge of it and thought that it was kind of an early Speak Now cut as it was kind of written around 2009. So Mr. Perfectly Fine appears to be the only song that was included on Taylor's version that was made after Fearless was released. Okay, so one of Taylor's MySpace posts um, may actually confirm when Mr. Perfectly Fine was written. So on March 19th, 2009, Taylor said, I've been in the studio all day. I know, I know, we just put out a new album. I think I have a problem. I cannot stop writing songs. So what's quite interesting is that obviously um, we know who Mr. Perfectly Fine has written about. Um, yes. and one of the songs that is included on Fearless, Forever and mm -hmm. Always, was written very close to the end of yep. Fearless kind of being released. And it's interesting that these songs are obviously in the same kind of universe in terms of who they are about. So it's interesting that um, Mr. Perfectly Fine was written kind of after and that Taylor was still really, really writing lots of songs even towards the end of Fearless's kind of um, release. And I wonder if maybe Forever and Always replaced another song or just kind of added to the track list very interesting to think about because it's something that I also thought about when listening to Mr. Perfectly Fine. I thought, wow, this is very similar in sentiment, obviously with a different kind of bridge to yeah. um, Forever and Always. Like you said, Forever and Always, very interesting that it was a last minute edition. Did it replace one of these songs or did it replace one of the songs that were eventually on the Platinum, on platinum version? Yeah. It's definitely interesting to see what, or to just to even think about what she could have replaced some 
and others with. With. I definitely think this song may have missed out, obviously, because it was written like further along the line. Yeah. But even if it was written at the same time, it could have missed out because of that Forever and Always song being played on. And I think also, um, I've always felt like Mr. Perfectly Fine sonically sounds very similar to You Belong With Me. I've just, I don't know why I've always kind of felt like they have a kind of very similar sound. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe that's maybe another reason why it wasn't included on, say, the Platinum Edition, because it was in the if it was written around the time that we think it was around March in 2009 it definitely could have possibly made the um platinum edition of fearless um, it's interesting that it didn't even end up on there but um taylor has met, talked about the song miss perfectly fine and she's kind of said that it was an early indicator of her kind of creeping into a pop sensibility and taylor said i've always listened to every type of music and even through even though fearless is a country album there's always these pop melodies creeping in but i really love this song and i really love the bridge and i think the lyrics are just wonderfully scathing and full of teen angst and you just hope to hear on an album that i wrote when i was 17 or 18 so that's interesting that taylor mentioned as well that this kind of had the pop kind of influences again mm -hmm. with kind of the you belong with me kind of vibe so that's why i feel like it has that similar for me it's because of its kind of pop association i agree with you there and um it is that kind of poppy sound to it and maybe that's another reason that she wanted to leave it out of the um platinum edition because maybe it was just a bit too pop especially as we know and as we've spoken about before the record label kind of maybe holding her back uh, from placing too much pop or too many pop sounding songs on on her albums and another interesting thing is Mr Perfectly Fine the way it's structured and especially that narrative of things going wrong and then a bridge of looking back and saying well you could have had me but I got away it reminds me a lot about of some of the songs written for Speak Now so if yes. you think about it with Dear John, especially, it's like the clearest example, it has that bridge of, I took your matches before fire could catch me. And also it was quite interesting as well, when she was talking about the teen angst, that it was obviously written around the time when like Good For You was really blowing off with like Olivia Rodrigo. And I think weirdly these songs are quite similar in the kind of teen angst kind of feel. Um, so it's interesting that we, and also like you said about with the pop stuff, I think as well maybe why Taylor would have kept it off of Fearless was obviously she was kind of just starting to, you know, set a foundation in the country world. She was only really on yeah. album number two. And mm -hmm. Fearless was obviously doing incredibly well as a country album and was winning all these country awards. So maybe she was worried about possibly rocking the boat too early yep. because country fans are very kind of, uh, some traditionalists in the country kind of world are very thingy about, you know, oh, that's not country enough. That's too pop. You're too pop. Um, and I think even back then, people were starting to associate that with Taylor of, oh, she's not very country. She's too pop. So maybe... Um, one of the reasons why Miss Perfectly Fine was kind of shelved and vaulted was because of the fear that maybe that would then trigger people to um, really start to say that she was too pop and use that as mm -hmm. a kind of negative. I'm really glad that we've got it now. This is one of the only songs on the vault that really feels like it adds to the fearless kind narrative. of world yeah. and narrative. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. And it, but sometimes I do feel like lots of people think that fearless is about Joe Jonas when the majority of the songs aren't. Um, I think hmm. that sometimes it's almost been mythologized that Fearless is all about Joe Jonas when really there's only, it's only really till the Platinum Edition that we probably start to get those songs. So um, a lot of the songs that were written for Fearless were written around the times of some of these other songs like We Were Happy and stuff. But for me, I've always felt like they they enhance the debut story. Um, but for me, Perfectly, Miss Perfectly Fine feels like it enhances the Fearless story a bit more. Okay, so Mr. Perfectly Fine was eventually released as a promotional single just two days before Taylor's, Taylor's version was dropped on the 7th of April um, 2021, and it was produced by Jack Antonoff. And obviously, unlike you all over me, we don't have a leaked version, so we don't know the lyrical differences, so we can't unfortunately talk about those. Next up, we have We Were Happy, which was originally written with Liz Rose. And... Liz Rose, of course, is Taylor's longtime collaborator and also the co-writer of All Too Well. And you can really tell that she was involved because all of the songs that Taylor wrote with Liz have this particular heartbreaking quality to them or, you know, most of them. And um, We Were Happy is no exception to that. So it initially appeared on a demo CD from 2005 and was available as two demos have leaked, including a piano demo, which is a very, very beautiful one. On Taylor's version, we have Keith Urban singing harmonies in the background for We Were Happy. This song is kind of mysterious because Taylor has never described outright what it's about, but obviously the lyrics lead us to believe 
that it's about a very heartbreaking end to a relationship which there's nothing really gone wrong specifically there's not one thing that has broken down the relationship but things have just changed and she's looking back at the times when they were happy i love this song i think it's an amazing addition to to fearless i know that not everyone thinks the same right yeah i i <laughs> weirdly i've always loved i always always loved the demo version um the unreleased mm -hmm. version yes. and I always loved its production. It weirdly was kind of like a, it was almost like a 1989 song where the lyrics were really sad, but the production could kind of make you think that maybe it wasn't. If you know what I mean, it okay. kind of had a bit more of a kind of slightly upbeat, not in terms of like properly upbeat, but just slightly more upbeat. The tempo was a bit. Yeah. Yeah. The tempo Whereas has been brought down. Yeah. The Taylor's version, yeah, was really brought down. And I don't know, part of me, I think from years and years of listening to the unreleased version, I just found it quite kind of, strange listening to the taylor's version that was so much more sadder um mm -hmm. and weirdly for me i still feel like it's unreleased i it's so weird hearing these songs that have been unreleased for ages and then are actually like officially released it's re i find it really odd and it sometimes is strange mm. i forget that it, like some of these songs are now actually officially released like we were happy i think it's one of those that um i get that i understand and i have read a lot of people also speaking about how the original sounded more emotional than this one however i kind of disagree i know that she's obviously probably not as invested in this song but i do think that the combination of the experience that she gained from folklore and evermore and telling especially evermore and these heartbreaking stories they do bleed into how she faced some of these vault tracks and especially we were happy because in a way and i guess that's why i love it so much because i do adore evermore Aaron Desna production for me makes this kind of like a secret Evermore track, but from a long, long time ago. It is. That's why I, think, I, love I, th <laughs> I think that's why a lot of these songs have that feel is because Taylor, when she was making Evermore, was making Fearless. And I think that's why there is a real crossover and why lots hmm. of people, because obviously there was a lot of discussion, negative and positive, um, from some fans about that these songs felt too Evermore or felt, felt, felt too folklore y. And I think that's just because they were created in the same time and in that same universe um so i think that's why they have that feel and that maybe that's why we were happy it has the more kind of heartbreaky kind of feel and you know that is kind of more subdued in its kind of feeling um in terms of the production because it, it was kind of being created around the time when they were creating evermore um so it is interesting um but yeah it's it's it does feel slightly i think especially you all over me it's definitely feels like that way and i think we were happy does as well mr mm. perfectly fine feels very late Poppy. fearless yeah, yeah. late it, fearless it, kind of speak, and that's when in now. my opinion as well yeah uh but then we have don't you which we'll get to we'll get to yeah 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 but yeah very interesting and um in terms of we were happy the last thing to mention is that lyrically it wasn't really changed too much okay so the next song on the track list is that's when so this song was written with the Warren Brothers probably in 2005. When talking about um, That's When recently, Taylor said that they came up with this song about space and independence and what happens when two people love each other, but one of them just needs to take a breather. And Taylor kind of said that um, rather than writing about a song where um, someone wasn't sure and leaving and not wanting to talk again, this song is kind of what would happen if the partner turned around and said, no, look, I'm here for you. If you need to take space, then do it. Taylor said that they were kind of playing around with that idea and then eventually came up with this song. So much like We Were Happy, Keith Urban was kind of brought in, um, but unlike We Were Happy, um, where he is just purely background vocals, Keith is deemed a feature and is a kind of proper real feature, is given kind of verse and a lot of time in the kind of chorus. Um, and it's talking on The Ellen Show, uh, Keith mentioned how Taylor kind of texted him these two songs, the We Were Happy and That's When, and how he was just in the middle of a mall listening to two unreleased Taylor's, Taylor songs, which I just think is crazy. Imagine just getting a text off of Taylor with two never heard before versions of songs yeah. um, oh and just God. the fact that you're kind of listening to it in a mall that would just you're just chilling the fact, in the mall <laughs> and the fact that you can't really tell anyone you know like no. i've got two taylor swift songs just sat on my you know phone now that i'm like listening to that are totally unreleased i think that's such an exciting and cool thing and it's the same with how phoebe mentioned when taylor mentioned a text her 
asking her to be on Nothing New and how she said that she'd been waiting for that text her entire life. The excitement that Taylor had sent you like a never heard before song, especially Nothing New. Like, to be fair, I don't think that Keith would have gone out of his way and listened to the no. uh, demo version of That's When. <laughs> he yeah. didn't know all we were happy because if he really wanted to, he could have realised that they were not unreleased as he Exclusive. may have thought. <laughs> but yeah. Nothing New and like, I bet you think about me with Chris Stapleton, the fact that you mm. were hearing those songs. I just couldn't imagine that feeling of like, oh my God, I'm hearing something that like the rest of the world hasn't. Anyways, um, as mentioned, the song does change perspectives and Taylor talked about this in an interview. So in an interview, Taylor mentioned the perspective change in that Swen and how they originally didn't write it as a kind of duet. However, over time, um, Taylor felt like because she hadn't ever really sung from that perspective of someone telling someone that they could take their time, um, she decided to kind of turn it into a duet. However, she did say that there's very little changes and very minimal. So you are still hearing the song from a 17 year old or 18 year old perspective and brain completely changes the essence of the song because now we have two people having a conversation. I think that obviously when it was originally written that was nowhere to be seen but from Red onwards and especially Folklore Evermore and even Lover we have these collaborations where she collaborates with another usually male artist and they give these two perspectives and this conversation feel and I think with yes. all of that experience that she had from those songs she was able to go back and make this song amazing like that perspective that conversation they're having is so good yeah no I agree I really do agree um and also I think what's quite interesting as well is that obviously like we mentioned the um the fact that Taylor was kind of changing up the lyrics and whether then these songs and maybe that's why maybe some of these songs do for some people feel like they aren't very fearlessy because mm. maybe some of the lyrics now are enhanced with you know Taylor's kind of 30 year old like 30 years of life experience and her kind of songwriting ability that has improved massively even since kind of obviously she was 17 she was still amazing then but it's even more impressive now so it is interesting that um so maybe with these kind of lyrical changes the perspective feels more grown up or feels more kind of enhanced in comparison to maybe a 17 and 18 year old kind of innocence to the song and i think that's what the original demo track does have in comparison to the taylor's version but i personally just love the taylor's version i think the perspective yeah. change and the duet feel of the song um, really really works and really really enhances on the original okay so as mentioned uh, there is a big perspective change and that means that a lot of the lyrics have sometimes changed as well so in the original demo um, one of the lyrics is he watched me crash to the floor on my knees just like that which was replaced in the taylor version with and i knew my words were hard to hear and harder to ever take back another lyric from the original demo version is because i let you go but you let me think i'd be fine without you imagine that which was then changed on the taylor version to then through the phone came all your tears and I said leave those all in our past. Also it's important to mention that this song was produced by Jack Antonoff and as ever Jack is a like a production mastermind, lyrical mastermind um, and did, did an amazing job on that's when and I think um, is um, shows off his incredible kind of producing skills. Um, I think Taylor and Jack together always create um, whenever I have a favourite song on a Taylor album, whenever it's I look Jack. at the lyric bo yep. booklet, it's always <laughs> produced by Jack. Always, yep. always, always. He is just a genius. That's all I can say. Next up, we have Don't You, which was written with Brett James. And it's the one of the only two songs that had no public leaks prior to, obviously, when we got to hear Taylor's version last year. However, the Inner Circle had a piano version of the song, which they described as... A melancholy piano demo with haunting vocals that have a sadness and longing to them. This was likely recorded in 2005 and was probably considered for the first album. Taylor runs into her ex and feels pain because it brings back so many hurt feelings and sad emotions. She feels that she still loves him and wonders why he doesn't feel the same way. She will try her best to go on with her life. In addition to that piano version, they also had another two studio recordings, which was one was guitar based and one was piano based, but with no Taylor vocals on them. So this is really interesting because even as uh, the Inner Circle initially admitted, they thought it was a cut song from the debut album. Yes. And to be fair, I feel like when I first heard Don't You felt like By The Way's sister, I feel like they're basically the same right. yeah. song, like the same perspective. That you know, running into your ex and feeling this pain. Whereas by yes. the way, it's kind of the sadness of them realizing that they've really moved on with their lives. Whereas don't you, it's just more about like in, in looking at yourself and how you deal with seeing them. Um, and then obviously they were written around the same time. And 
uh, I really, really hope that By the Way was going to be on the track list for Fearless Taylor's version, and I pray that it's going to be on the track list for debut because I all I want to hear is Taylor's new vocals on By the Way. I just desperately, 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 desperately want to hear it. Like you said, if they're too similar, it yeah. might lead to her not including that. The themes and that are similar, but it just I, I guess it's up to Taylor whether she feels like there's more of yeah. a differentiation between them or not. And I think, to be fair, when we go on to mention about um, Bye Bye Baby and about similarities and mm-hmm. even things like similarities in song titles, um, yes. I think that, yeah, that's an interesting thing to mention. And maybe that might hint that, by the way, might not be included because it's very, very, very similar to Don't You. But to be fair, things like um, I Bet You Think About Me and um, uh, I Almost Do are very yeah. similar, just from Again. a different perspective. Yeah, that's true. That's true. They have the same themes and the same kind of message, but obviously spun in a very different kind mm. of way and maybe that's why the inner circle felt like it would have been for taylor's first album because of its association with lots of the themes on the first album um and it also kind of even gives me kind of tis the damn season vibes and i'm not sure maybe if that was coming and taylor was kind of writing those songs because she was mm-hmm. kind of going back to these kind of fearless songs but no um i really do love don't you i really really love it and really glad that it was included on fearless taylor's version and we got to hear it and it was nice to hear a song that we hadn't really heard in any format at all um because yes. upon fearless's release we had already heard um you all over me we'd already heard miss perfectly fine we'd obviously heard um demo versions of um bye bye baby that's when we were happy so don't you was actually the only song that i had never heard so um don't you was the one that i was most excited for um definitely when i first heard it how do you feel about it yeah that's definitely bittersweet to think about because in a way we have no way to compare to what it once was but at the same time i don't mind that like i i was quite grateful to have this new slash old song judging and based on the other experience or the other way that Taylor treated the rest of the vault tracks. I think that she was quite respectful of her old work, adding maybe a couple of things in, and obviously also drawing from the experience of writing Folklore and Evermore, and that, like you said, like it is similar to Tis Damn Season in a way of that longing that she's able to express through her voice and, and the lyric. Definitely one a favourite from me, and again, Jack Antonoff produced, so that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I think Jack does such an amazing job of producing it. And do you feel like, Taylor, that there is any... When you listen to it, do you feel like, oh, these are all the original lyrics? Obviously, we don't know, but just from mm-hmm. purely speculative. Do you think, oh, these are original lyrics? Or do you think, oh, no, these lyrics have been maybe changed by Yeah, it's hard Taylor? to say because especially with breakup songs and with sad songs, Taylor did such a good job, even back to the debut album. A lot of people snub the debut album's lyricism, but all you have to do is listen to Cold As You and things like that, which show that her lyricism right back from 2005 or even previous she's able to spin metaphors and she was able to write back in the day as well so i think she was quite capable of writing this i do think she, that she did change things here and there it has they have you know they have yeah there probably is a couple of lyrics kind of here and there and but like mentioning debut songs that um lyrically are really impressive i've always loved tied together with smile that's been one of my favorite songs mm-hmm. taylor songs for a long time um, and the lyrics and metaphors in that song, I think, are really gorgeous. So, yeah, I think people sometimes do. And I think um, just hearing things like You All Over Me, um, That's When, and Don't You, the fact that they were written, you know, around the time of the debut album, I think it's really interesting and really shows Taylor's incredible songwriting, even from day one. Um, and I think sometimes with the debut album, obviously with the debut album, you have to kind of show your versatility and all the stuff that you can do and have a song for every kind of emotion so that you don't isolate yourself nowadays maybe that's not so much the case but back then especially you know um big machine as we know were very involved Mm. in crafting the albums and what they wanted and their vision for it and i think that maybe that was the case with debut and that's why maybe there's you know some songs on there like um perfectly good heart and stuff that people are, have mixed feelings about because i feel like it was included so that it could show that taylor could was a very versatile artist and wasn't just all sad breakup songs you know about yeah. exes and stuff there was kind of some positivity in there with you know um i'm only me when i'm with you and stuff like that speaking about don't you taylor mentioned that we wrote it about the idea of seeing someone that you used to have a thing for and seeing them out in public for the first time after you've heard that they've moved on And you know your life is kind of in shambles and they have moved on and they're really happy. And it's almost like even them being nice to you hurts you because you're in such a state of pain and you haven't moved on yet. 
So that was really where they were drawing from and um, that emotion, which really comes through in the song. And again, very, very heartbreaking. Okay, so the next um, song on the Fearless Taylor's version uh, from the vault track list is Bye Bye Baby. So this song was previously known in the fandom as The One Thing or One Thing. What is quite interesting about this song is The One Thing was originally um, on the initial kind of mirror track list for Fearless, however, was never included. So it's interesting that it eventually did actually end up on Fearless, but obviously on Taylor's version. The original The One Thing um, leaked in 2010. Um, how do you feel about the fact that the title of the track was changed and why do you think maybe that was the case? Yeah, I know this is very controversial, especially for people who've been around in the fandom for a long time, because you know, you get used to a song being called a certain way and then for it to be completely changed and especially the, the name of it is crazy to think of because you kind of like grow attached to to it. And this song is one that she changed the most. Like yes. that perspective change in That's When has nothing to do with all of the scrap lyrics. If you guys listening haven't ever heard what we called the one thing I do recommend it because it's really really interesting to compare all of those changes and see how the life of the one thing kind of ended and the life of bye bye baby became I'm okay with it being changed because we still have that other version that you can go back to and the changes really do exhibit Taylor's lyrical songwriting and how it has grown over time like in other cases we can say that you know the changes aren't too strong you can really tell how she's grown as a songwriter and obviously this was the one that she was the least happy with or the least willing to leave the same yeah it's interesting that she felt like this was the one that she really had to change up and I do think the change lyrics are stronger and are more vividly mm. had a kind of a stronger metaphor to the song but um, it, it's interesting that she felt like she had to change it so much. I just think, was there maybe not another song that you felt like could have been on Fearless that you felt was strong enough to, to not be changed? And personally, right. I, I do prefer the one thing as okay. a title. I'm not a big oh, fan. Oh, uh, yeah, as a title, yeah. Ironically, considering she um, some of the original lyrics in maybe the one thing she felt like were too juvenile or not strong enough, and that's why they were changed. Personally, I feel like the title Bye Bye Baby feels more juvenile than the title the one thing and as an album closer it makes sense it's kind yeah. of like a nice little way to sign off of an album we couldn't really keep the one thing as a title because those lyrics yeah exactly yeah they don't exist anymore and also obviously it has um it's the one maybe one of the reasons why she felt like she had to change it was because obviously on folklore we have the song the one so i'm mm -hmm. not sure maybe if the one thing was too similar um or not um but it is interesting that yeah that that title was kind of totally changed and weirdly i I, I forget sometimes that the one thing and Bye Bye Baby are the same song. I almost see them as totally <laughs> different purely because of just the title changes. Like when I mention the one thing, I don't think about Bye Bye Baby in that same context. If you know what I mean, it's really strange. It kind of feels like two entities because of so many changes. Okay, so Taylor talked about the song Bye Bye Baby and said that it was one of the songs that really got stuck in her head and that the idea of kind of disappointment when you really, really cared about someone and then you kind of get let down was something that she really liked about the song and that's what the kind of song is about. I think that's interesting how she described the song as well because I've read a lot of discussion about how the changes in this song could lead us to read it in a completely different way from more of a recent perspective. So instead of being like a breakup and a letdown by someone you were in love with, more of a breakdown of a relationship, a relationship such as her relationship with her label. And when you listen to it that way, there are some things that really remind you of that situation. And I could understand why she would make those changes to make this more of a song that fits into her current situation. Yeah, and I think the fact that she mentioned that it's, that it's like facing disappointment when it comes to someone that you really cared about. Yep. She doesn't even say about, um, you know, a, a relationship or stuff in comparison to say that's when. And no, that is quite interesting. And also then mirrors things like Breathe, um, which is obviously about a friendship rather than a mm -hmm. relationship breaking up. And yeah, I definitely think that maybe you're correct there that it does have that. And maybe that's one of the reasons why she changed it is so that it mm -hmm. had a took on a new meaning. And I think lots of these songs do take on new me meanings. Sometimes stuff that um, Taylor has written uh, years ago takes on kind of new meanings like Stay, Stay, Stay had a very different feel when you listen to it, the Taylor's version of it. And I think maybe Bye Bye Baby is one of those songs that she felt like uh, kind of re going back to that song and changing up some of the lyrics gave it a new kind of meaning and importance to her. Definitely and it's also interesting that when looking at those changed lyrics uh, a lot of them include 
references to writing she now says i see your writing on the dash and then there's other parts where she speaks about instead of saying and i can feel you like you're slipping through my hands she now says and all the pages are just slipping through my hands so could these be somehow references to writing literally like songs and the pages slipping out yeah, of her hands being a loss of the masters perhaps uh, yeah and maybe the kind of the writing on the dash is having to see like big machine maybe on mm -hmm. uh, like when you're listening to the radio yeah like yeah yeah um, and says so like big machine on her dashboard um because some like some cars and stuff they like tell you the song and the lyric and, and the song and the title the artist and the stuff so maybe it's something like that rather than a physical picture whereas before it felt very like teardrops on my guitar with the kind of like you know i have your picture and stuff like that mm. um whereas yeah the fact that it changed the kind of the writing and suggestion of lyrics and stuff and losing grip of lyrics and songs um i think definitely that's a really interesting perspective and i think one that i can get behind in reference to some other change lyrics from the original the one thing to bye bye baby we also have um in the chorus she initially said and all you have is to walk away from the one thing i thought would never leave me which is where the name comes from too and all i have is your sympathy because you took me home but you just couldn't keep me and then obviously bye bye baby bye bye baby Another interesting one, apart from the ones that we have already mentioned, is in the second verse, and in the original version, she said, it's black and white, you're smiling down at me. And then in Taylor's version, she says, on the dresser, they can just like me. Uh, she also changes the conversation to your hesitation. And I'm lost in the sound of it, but the here in the now comes in to guess I never doubted it then the here and the now floods in. So again, as we can see, just much more metaphorical, much more grown up. And that you took me home and I thought you were gonna keep me, but you just couldn't keep me. It's very interesting to see again, I can relate that a lot to the record company. Yeah, and also I think what's quite interesting is the original kind of the one thing has a feeling of like, um, why am I not good enough for you? You've left me. Mm. Whereas the Bye Bye Baby has a feeling of like, you know like you just couldn't deal with me like i was too you know you couldn't keep me rather than yeah I couldn't your keep hesitation you. yeah yes. exactly i guess like, i never doubted it but exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. whereas the one so thing the one thing has a feeling of like why couldn't i keep you you've disappeared you were the one thing that i needed whereas uh, bye bye baby has a feeling of like yeah you just couldn't keep me goodbye <laughs> no, <so> yeah. <laughs> yeah, bye -bye. Yeah, yeah so no but yeah it is very interesting this one ironically even though that's when it has the perspective change bye this bye baby the has most. the most kind of yeah. change even though weirdly you would think that that's when would feel like the one that was totally different but i think because of the title change and the like really distinct lyrical change to bye bye baby um this one personally for me feels like it was the one that was changed the most and also we should mention that this track was also produced by jack antonoff as well finally about bye bye baby gonna be included in the original and then it wasn't then I guess maybe she had it in Possibilities for Platinum, because if you had it in Possibilities for the original, I'm guessing she probably had it there as well, but then it wasn't. And then it finally made its comeback now, so it's it's nice to see that it did finally get an appearance. So with that, that is the six Vault songs that we received last year. Having this year between your initial reactions to them and now, how has that changed? Do you have a favourite now that wasn't then? Has your favourite remained the same? what is the standout song for you i think on initial listen my favorites were that's when and don't you and i think they are still the same now um nice yeah personally for me mr perfectly fine it, i don't know is it has a kind of it feels i think it's one of those songs that i would have really really loved back in the day and would feel really nostalgic about now but personally mm. i just really love the feel of the kind of that's when don't you the kind of folklore evermore kind of vibe songs so um those two were my standouts and are still my standouts what about you that's interesting because mine are very similar i love that's when i love don't you and i also love we were happy and it's funny because i think my favorite and this has changed a lot because the first time i listened that's when was my favorite and then i guess you all over me i was quite fond of but over time i have learned to love and appreciate we were happy it's just amazing that lyric change that you were gonna marry me oh it's yeah. heart-wrenching and i adore it and um so i think i'm gonna have to go with that one or that's when uh because of that perspective change again really enhances that song but yeah they they i think that the six songs themselves were good choices and yes. they've stood the test of time 
and I'm happy that she gave them to us with those changes and with the perspective that she has now because I think she did an amazing job at presenting things that are you know almost 15 16 17 years old but they Made hold them feel up new and fresh and yeah exactly and they hold up in today's music industry so well yeah the fact that like Mr Perfectly Fine did really well and everyone mm -hmm. kind of really like I said it, it it is very similar to Good For You, that same kind of feeling. And I think that's one of those things with Taylor Swift songs where they're so, they're about Timeless. real feelings. You know, yeah. those feelings don't change. People still have those feelings and they're still there. And even in, you know, a 2008 context or a 2021 context, they work because they're so lyrically strong and the emotions and feelings are there. So it doesn't matter when or how they're released or in what way, they still kind of really connect to people. With that, we've reached the end of this episode. We would like to thank you all for rating us on Spotify and Apple Music with amazing five-star reviews. That's very, very kind of you all. Please continue to do so because it really motivates us to continue with these interesting episodes. Uh, make sure to follow us over on Instagram where we will be linking in our episode extras all of the demos to all of these songs and the things that we've spoken about today. And of course, please do subscribe over on our YouTube channel and leave us comments about what your favourite song from The Vault was and if you expected any other songs that never appeared on The Vault to appear and what you think may happen with them. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.